we know that our ancient ancestors were great inventors. They were every bit as inventive and resourceful as the greatest minds of today. In fact, some people would say that they were even more inventive than we are because they had so little prior knowledge to work from. Some of the greatest inventive works from centuries ago still blow the minds of the greatest critical thinkers of today. And here are some fine examples. When the Hall Saflieni Hypogeum was discovered in Malta in 1902 by workers attempting to build a water cistern, the first things archaeologists found at the site were 7,000 sets of human remains. Unsurprisingly, they concluded that the site was an ancient mass grave. Burials were certainly a big part of whatever went on here, but we now believe there was a lot more to it than that. This 6,000-year-old structure, carved by hand into soft limestone, is the world's most ancient example of advanced sound engineering. Any sound made inside its innermost chamber is amplified and resonates to such an extent that it can be heard throughout the whole structure and even has a measurable effect on the human mind. The effect is comparable to modern infrasound technology. It would take a very talented sound engineer to come up with such precision today, so we have no idea how it was achieved back then. That's not even the strangest thing about Hal Salfieni Hypogeum, though. That distinction goes to the human bodies, which have elongated skulls that scientists believe are the result of genetics rather than body modification. Who could these people possibly have been? And how did they create this sound system? Our next artifact has several names, but precisely zero credible explanations of its origin or purpose. It's the Disk of Sabu, also sometimes known as the Schist Disk or the Saqqara Disk. The latter name is a clue that it was discovered in Saqqara, Egypt. The best guess of archaeologists is that the 5,000-year-old artifact is a highly elaborate candlestick holder. If that's the case, it's the only one of its kind we've ever found. The fact that it's obsidian suggests there's more to it than a simple candlestick holder. Obsidian is a notoriously difficult material to work with, and nobody would go to the trouble of making a candlestick holder out of it back then when other materials were available. Even the fact that it's shaped like a wheel is a puzzle, because as far as we're aware, the Egyptians were yet to discover the wheel 5,000 years ago. Conspiracy theorists on the internet will try to tell you that this is the steering wheel of an alien spaceship. We're not about to believe that, but the candlestick explanation is wholly unsatisfying. A little over 4,000 years ago, a brand new pigment was invented in ancient Egypt. Today, we call it Egyptian blue, and it was originally developed to adorn a crown on a famous bust of Nefertiti. We have no way of knowing whether the chemists who came up with it were aware of what they were doing at the time, but there's far more to this pigment than just a pretty color. This brilliant shade of blue can reduce energy consumption and can also amplify solar energy output if applied in the right way. In early 2020, a German research team even used Egyptian blue to create new nano sheets for infrared imaging. To give the substance its proper name, Egyptian blue is calcium copper silicate and is thought to be one of the first ever artificial colors ever created by human hands. It's a stunning color and was used in the time of the New Kingdom to decorate everything from statues to sarcophagi. When a very thin layer is exfoliated from a grain of the pigment, a nano sheet 100,000 times thinner than a human hair can be created, and the properties of that sheet are ideal for optical imaging. Now we know that, this ancient substance might be responsible for the next great era of microscopy. Our next artifact is also Egyptian and is most commonly known as the Offering Table of Dead Fiji. Whether that's a fair name for it or not is unknown, because we know virtually nothing about it. You'll find it in the Leiden Museum of Antiquities in the Netherlands, where it's been since 1830. It's an alabaster disc, possibly a tabletop, that was created around 5,000 years ago. What makes it so unusual is the complex series of designs and inscriptions that cover its surface, which remind some observers of a circuit board, or possibly even a series of control panels. 
there are a few small holes drilled into the surface of the disc, which would possibly have provided a space for candles to be inserted into it, or possibly for oils to be stored. An object with such a humble purpose surely wouldn't have been decorated so elaborately, though. What are these markings? Might they be instructions of some kind? If we could understand them, would they tell us what the object was used for? Historians say that it probably had a religious or ceremonial purpose. But then again, that's what historians tend to say about every artifact that they don't understand. Chromium steel, also known as stainless steel, is widely used today in manufacturing because of its rust-resistant properties. It's a difficult substance to create, which is why we tend to think of it as a relatively modern invention. But in September 2020, we found out that it's anything but. In fact, chromium steel was invented in Persia almost 1,000 years before its secrets were discovered anywhere else in the world. This latest information comes from the Journal of Archaeological Science, which has identified Chahak Iran as the ancient world's greatest steel production center. A recipe for making chromium steel can be found in a manuscript entitled a Compendium to Know the Gems, written by Abu Rehan Biruni during either the 10th or 11th century. Further evidence for chromium steel production has also been detected in 12th century crucible and smithing slags found in the area. Researchers don't yet understand why the production of the steel appears to have been limited only to this area, and why the knowledge of how to make it appears to have been forgotten for hundreds of years afterwards. Although the religions of Hinduism, Jainism, and Buddhism differ from each other, they share some key beliefs. One of them is that the Vajra is the chosen weapon of the gods. You'll find mentions of Vajra going back as far as the Rig Veda, the first part of the four known Vedas. From an etymological point of view, there are two ways we can understand the word Vajra, both of which come from Sanskrit. The first is as lightning, and the second is as diamond. In both instances, it's thought the intention of the word is to represent the weapon as an irresistible force. According to mythology, Indra was told directly by Vishnu that a weapon made from the bones of the Hindu sage Darichi would be capable of destroying the serpent demon known as Vritra. The weapon in question was created by the divine artisan Dvashtar and proved to be successful. Indian traditions hold the Vajra as the most powerful weapon in the universe. That's a bold claim for a weapon that's basically a club with a ribbed head, but there's no shortage of people who believe in it. A site as large as Borobudur Temple in Magalang, Indonesia, needs a suitably large legend to cover its creation, and it has one. It's said that a whole army of monks worked together to build the gigantic 8th century temple site by hand which, given the fact that it's made of more than 180,000 cubic feet of lava rock, seems unlikely. It's as ornate as it is massive. There are more than 500 Buddha statues and reliefs that mark the path to the top of the steppe pyramid site, all of which tell us what life was like during the days of Buddhist Java. Sadly, they don't tell us why it was suddenly abandoned in the 1300s, after which it stood empty and forgotten for 500 years. There's another mystery on top of that, too. The location is surrounded by active volcanoes, and there's regular seismic activity around it as well. Without anyone to look after it for five centuries, it withstood earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. Not only do we not understand how Borobudur was built, but we also don't understand how it survived. Is the Voynich Manuscript a beautifully elaborate practical joke or a message for humanity written in a code that nobody can translate. Academics have been arguing over that question ever since the manuscript was found in Rome in 1912, and they've yet to reach a conclusion. While there might be plenty of people who believe it's a forgery or a joke, Yale University in the USA is sufficiently convinced of its authenticity to keep it in the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library. The story of the manuscript prior to its 1912 discovery is unknown, but radiocarbon dating of the pages it's written on suggests it has a 15th century origin. The book runs to 240 pages and is full of mysterious illustrations. 
The illustrations would probably make sense to anybody who could read the script, but unfortunately nobody can. The unknown author of the Voynich manuscript even provided a cipher for the code, but either the cipher doesn't work, or the academics who've studied it don't understand it properly. The topics covered within the text are wide and varied. On one page, you might see a detailed picture of a flower, but on the next, there might be a drawing of a dress or a pair of shoes. This might be nothing but a 15th century home and fashion guide. But then, what would be the point of encoding it? Many people are obsessed with buying branded goods these days, but branding and marketing appear to go back much further than most people imagine. We know that because it seems that at one point, a little over 1,000 years ago, every warrior worth his salt in Europe wanted an Ulfbert sword like this one. They've been found all over the continent, and experts believe they probably started out as a Viking trend, although that can't be proven. As far as we know, they were the first swords ever to be made from casts, with iron melted together with carbon and then poured into a mold. That process did away with the impurities that weakened many of the blades of the era and gave the warriors who owned them an advantage in combat. Nobody else in Europe appears to have been able to replicate the process for at least 200 years, so the question of how the Vikings came up with the idea is unknown. It might have been stolen from an Asian tribe they conquered, but that's really little more than a best guess. It's entirely possible that the Phaistos disc bears a message from our ancient ancestors that might tell us a hundred things we don't know about them and the era in which they lived. Unfortunately, we're having a hard job translating it, and it's doubtful that we'll ever crack the code. The heavily decorated disc was found in the remains of a Minoan palace on the Greek island of Crete many years ago, and it's been puzzling scientists ever since. There are more than 200 different inscriptions on the disc, and not one of them corresponds with any form of written language discovered anywhere else on the planet. With no substantial evidence to go on, the meaning of the disc is wide open to interpretation. Some people think that it might be a calendar, Others suspect that it might contain a prayer written in the secret language of a long-forgotten religious cult. There are too many symbols for the text to represent an alphabet, and yet too few for it to constitute a script. The maze-like spiral design was probably significant to its designers also. But we can't fathom the purpose of that either. It's a total enigma! We don't know whether to call the Codex Gigas a scientific mystery, a religious secret, or both. What we can say about it for sure is that it's the world's largest medieval manuscript, and both its origins and its purpose are shrouded in intrigue and rumor. It's not just a long book, it's also physically massive at three feet high and containing over 600 pages, most of which are made of animal skins. To make matters even more mystifying, the chief subject matter on those pages is Satan. If the stories associated with the Codex Gigas are correct, the whole book was written by one Benedictine monk working alone during the 13th century. It's said that the monk went insane and broke all of his vows, and then created the entire manuscript over the course of just one night. The handwriting all appears to have come from the same hand, and the nightmarish illustrations of the devil certainly give credence to the idea that they were the product of an unwell mind. Realistically, though, it ought to have taken 10 full years to complete. If you're curious, you can see it yourself in a glass case in the King's Library of Stockholm, Sweden. We're finishing in India, because we have a very strange carving inside a temple to look at. This is Panchavarnaswami Temple in Warayur, Tamil Nadu, and it's more than 2,000 years old. That means the carvings on its walls are also presumably more than 2,000 years old, and so we have a problem. Here, plain as day, we see a carving of a man riding a bicycle. That shouldn't be possible because the bicycle wasn't invented until the 18th century. Still, though, there doesn't seem to be anything else that this carving could represent. Whatever this person is sitting on has two wheels, spokes, a frame, and handlebars. The presence of the bicycle carving inside the temple remains an unexplained mystery. The only plausible explanation seems to be that the temple was renovated during the 1920s. 
This is around the same time that chain-driven bicycles entered mass production and became popular. So it's possible that an artist of the time thought it was a fine idea to deface an ancient temple by adding bicycle graffiti. That theory isn't proven though, and anyone caught performing such an act of vandalism would likely have faced dire consequences. Subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, and enjoy watching new videos on my channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon!